This podcast is a collaboration between Costard and Touchstone Productions and the Dads from the Crypt Podcast. Hi, it's Alan, and welcome to another episode of the How Not to Make a Movie Podcast. We asked a bunch of episodes back, season two, episode 18, who's really the boss on any movie or TV set? One of the answers, why, it's the first assistant director, of course. On a TV set, that's pretty true. There, the first AD works for the producers. On a movie set, by contrast, the first may be paid by the producers, but in their mind, they work for the director. Lee Webb was a first AD for three seasons of Tales from the Crypt, seasons three through six, and for Demon Knight. So mostly he worked for us, Crypt's producers. Pretty much everyone who worked on Crypt felt the same way about doing the show. It was special, really, really special. And Lee is no different. As I've said before, one of the great benefits of doing this podcast and having deep nuts and bolts conversations with friends and coworkers is that I get to learn so much more about my friends and coworkers. They're even more amazing than I thought they were. Lee Webb checks every single one of those boxes. His own story is as compelling as any Crypt episode. He acted in the Partridge family and the Waltons. For three years, he drove an ambulance, which turned out to be his vehicle back into showbiz and eventually into becoming a first. What's more, Lee is a great storyteller all by himself. Along the way, we'll dish on some big names too. There'll be lots of love for Tom Hanks, not so much for Don Johnson. We'll talk about working with John Frankenheimer, Raul Julia, John Lithgow, Isabella Rossellini, and Toby Hooper. Yes, more Toby Hooper stories. And Lee will talk about his passion for skydiving. He had to quit recently, just shy of 4,000 jumps. And he'll talk about his current gig as a city councilor in Franklin, New Hampshire. That's Daniel Webster's hometown. This one covers a lot of territory. And all of it's kind of glorious. Here's Lee Webb. As we've all agreed, doing Tales from the Crypt was such a rare experience. Uh, Yeah. For me, it was was actually um, a pinnacle of my career because it was was working with you and Gil, whose method of of dealing with set issues was trusting the AD. In this case, that was me. Um, and I truly appreciated your faith in my decisions that were made instantaneously on the set. Because if I had had to run to a telephone every time we had a crisis, which would have been, what, 20 times a, a, a night, right. um, things would have been slowed exponentially. So for you to have that trust and faith in me was crucial and made me, well, I think that issue here tonight is to talk about what makes a good ad it made me a better ad because of that faith and trust well you know that faith and trust comes from not from just thin air and and just faith and trust you know when we prepped we got to know each other really well because we were as alan and i were writing we were we were constantly finishing each other's sentences excuse me the same thing happened with fa and eventually happened with you and so that trust, you realize, you understand that they understand, you understand what is important to us and what we're willing to sacrifice and what we're not willing to sacrifice. And that then and when once that's established, that tr- the trust really grows. And that's what happened with us. Yeah. What, once if everybody knows what we're all pulling the sled toward, it, it makes a it makes all the difference in the world. Well, that is also uh, bringing in the word collaborative. Because it's every, every successful production should be, at yeah. least in my opinion, a, a collaborative effort. Yeah, where you're all on the same page and you're all working towards the same goal. Yeah, whether one is building a cathedral or making a feature film or a TV show, yes, the, the, no one is going to do this all by themselves. That's right. And but Alan, that's- we never finish the cathedral. <laughs> Indeed, uh, we only have promises to keep and miles to go before we sleep. That's right. Uh, so how you got to Crypt, we will get to, but, uh, you know, looking back at, at, uh, you know, doing a little bit of of research that that I did on you, Lee, 
Uh, oh, you did research on me. There, there, there are some surprises in your background that, that I'm, I'm, I, I can hardly wait to ask you about. But uh, OK, OK, OK. You know, first I, I, first. I cannot even I, I can't even comprehend of surprises that you would wish to comment on. But OK. OK. You, you know. Uh, all right. Um, you you are now living back east in New Hampshire, but but you started back east. You 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 are an Easterner by. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was born in Boston and, and Boston will always be my city, hmm. uh, even though I was raised in the suburbs. But I've, I've always loved Boston. And trust me, when I lived in Los Angeles for 37 years, it was really difficult to be a Celtics fan. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, in gosh. Lakerland, yes. Considering oh, that I was of the generation where I, I, I would stay up until past midnight to watch live games of the finals. Um, when Lakers and Celtics were playing one another, so uh, I, I run into I ran into a few people over the years that that sympathized with my love of Boston and Boston sports teams, but hmm. not very many. I, uh, I I I not having known that about you, I went there were a lot of years where I was a, a very ardent uh, Lakers fan. <coughs> Excuse me, you know, during the the Shaq and Kobe years, I mean, I was a lunatic, lunatic. Yeah. Uh, and so these days I, I save it all for the Tottenham Hotspur. So I, I will get up at four thirty in the morning to watch the English Premiership. <laughs> that's that's dedication. I well, in terms of in terms of my, I, back, I know I know what that's like. I I I, yeah. I feel your 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 Celtic. Uh... Well, you'll 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 get an appreciation of this story. John Lithgow, you remember, was a guest a guest actor. Sure, you murderer. You won't. Won't, won't probably remember that I was asked as the AD to schedule around him on the very first day of shooting. And when he showed up on the second day, I politely asked um, uh, just what was going on. And obviously he was out of town and, and he said, well, I had to attend. And I think it was his aunt's birthday in Boston. And I said, Boston, Boston, or you're just saying Boston because you figure I wouldn't know where it really was. And he said, well, actually, it was in Melrose. And I said, well, I was raised in Melrose. <laughs> and he kind of laughed. And and uh, I, the next day I brought in, he told me that his aunt had, that had worked at the uh, high school in Melrose in the cafeteria. So I went home that night, went through, got my yearbook, found a picture of her oh, in the yeah. cafeteria crew. Oh. Oh brought God. it into the set the next day and showed John and he was thrilled. He was, it was just a wonderful moment. And he is uh, right at the top of my list of, of people with whom I love to work. He and Tom Hanks, both were, re, were a result of, of Tales from the Crypt. Yeah. 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 Both were an absolute pleasure to work with. I, <clears throat> it's funny. My, my, the, the biggest memory I have of Tom was the first day that he was prepping for his episode, the one that he directed. And uh, yeah, he met with all the department heads, I spent time with with you, and then it was lunchtime. And so we all, so Gil, Tom and I got into Gil's car to go, I forget where we went for lunch, but we get into Gil's car and Gil's driving, I'm sitting in the back and Tom is sitting in the front passenger seat and he gets into Gil's Lexus. And he proceeds, he turns on the radio, checks every radio station, uh, looks at the all the controls on the air conditioning. He goes into the glove box and begins <laughs> looking at stuff. He was the kid in in uh, in big. It was totally innocent. Just a, oh, that's interesting. What's that? What's that? It was, and I there was an insight into the man because it was just such an innocent, <laughs> childlike freedom. He felt so free that he could just do that. But it, I was. I knew I was looking at why he was so good and big because he had that inside him. So that explains where my hidden tuna fish sandwich may have gone. There you go. Yeah, there uh, you go. If, the mystery if, solved after all these yeah. years. If, if you look under the front seat, it's there. But man, it, it, it has grown wings. <laughs> if it were out of the front seat, you would have smelled it by now. God, we, we know. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it, it, I, I agree. Tom Hanks was great. Uh, John Lithgow was a real pleasure to work for. Oh. Yeah. Um, so is but, it Isabella Rosalini who was in oh, that same episode? Oh right. gosh! Oh well, yeah. Uh, it, we we uh, Randall when Randall Throp was, was was our guest. Uh, we all shared the story of, of when when she came in for her 
wardrobe fitting and she she wanted to to be wardrobed as her mom in Casablanca. So watching Isabella Rossellini laughing with such delight, seeing herself transformed into her mom was like you got to pinch yourself. You think, God, I'm standing. Am I really am I really watching this? Am I making this up? She not she not only looked like her mother, but she sounded like her mother. (laughs) She did. Oh, Oh, what a very much so. Very much so. But you know, uh, the best person that I, I found working on that particular episode, I love I love working with, with both of those actors and, and with Isabel as well. But my favorite was working, you know, with uh, Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. He was... Uh, you know, what in, I like best in, about in Humphrey Bogart... Digital Bogart, presence, what I, yes. What I like best about Humphrey Bogart in that episode was, you know, he never asked any questions. Uh, he never <laughs> ate anything left craft service alone didn't cost us any money no, no. to explain to the audience that he was dead by then <laughs> and that we were using clips but they were as weren't they were colorized clips weren't they yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um yeah because it would have been too 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 uh, weird to be black weird if and white. going right to black and white it would, it yeah. would have broken the, yeah. the whole illusion especially if he was if he was being seen in a mirror which is how we proposed yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly that was the conceit <laughs> yeah uh, what did, where did you go to school way where did i well um i went all the way from kindergarten to high to high school graduation in melrose well no but i mean you know, what went to, you go to college, college. Yeah. well to go to college i i was a typical rebellious teenager so i wanted to be as far away from massachusetts as possible so i i applied to the university of washington in seattle hmm. ucla and hmm. the university of hawaii and I consequently was uh, accepted at all three, but well Washington done. was was wet and cold, and um, Hawaii I'd heard bad things about being a mainlander and not being accepted by the uh, population. Sure, 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 sure. And I thought, sure, you know sure. what? It's going to be hard enough to acclimate myself to a a large university environment. So I figured UCLA, but that that choice actually, of course, set the course of the rest of my life. Huh. Wow. All right. So what year did you land? In 1967. LA? 1967. Right. Wow. Never having been in Los Angeles before. Wow. I got in a cab at LAX, took me to, to, to uh, UCLA, uh, dropped me off at campus. Um, and I was just literally over. Well, uh, population of Melrose at that time, it's about 28,000. The yeah. student population at UCLA was about 29,000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was, wow. talk about massive culture shock. I uh, bet. It, was, uh, it took me a while to get used to it, I must say. Where, where did you live at first when you moved to LA? What, what part of town? Oh, I, li- I, I lived on campus. Okay. I so lived at, right. I was, I was right, a right. dormitory person. Yeah. All right. So and then, and then I, uh, off season, you know, when we were during the summer, that first summer I spent in San Diego in my mother's apartment, sleeping on a couch for which she charged me rent because she had moved from Massachusetts to San Diego because we had relatives in San Diego. And that the second summer, I swore I'd never do that again. Um, and actually, it's a bizarre story, but the second summer was the summer of 69. Yeah, yeah. And I had gotten to know a fellow by the name of David Gerald. I don't know if that name rings any bells for you he was a science fiction writer his claim to fame at that time is that he had written three scripts for the original star trek wow Wow. and i had met him and uh i don't know how it all transpired the memory's kind of fuzzy about that but i ended up it was the 60s after all in his apartment and sharing the rent and working that summer at tommy's hamburgers no shit Wow. Grilling. I did all four positions. I was grill. I was some sandwich maker. I was the cashier. In fact, Tommy, who was still alive at that time, wow. trusted me more than his sons to be the cashier. And I was also the tamale. Whatever, whatever was needed, I did. And, and this I, is at I the, mean, the this original. Is, I was like what a nineteen-year-old college kid. And and this is at the original Tommy's on on Beverly Boulevard. On Beverly and Rampart. Yeah, absolutely. You you are a piece of LA history. Good God. <laughs> Well, it, uh, I, I, yeah, I experienced a lot of things in LA. 
what did you study at UCLA? What what what? Well, was that's your... an interesting question. I that's I, why uh, I asked it. Yeah, I well, I <laughs> I originally applied to UCLA, and because I was an out of stater, I thought it, it might behoove me to declare a major rather than just make my application as undeclared. I thought that they might accept me more readily if <laughs> I had a path. Um, so I I declared psychology as a major. And then when I got to campus and was halfway through orientation, I realized I would have to take a lot of science courses for that major. I said, well, that's no fun. I'm not I'm not here to really study. I'm here to experience life. Sure, sure. So I changed it to theater arts. There you go. OK. All right. So I could watch movies and plays and, be, you know, get credit for it. Uh, but when I, I actually left in my junior year in 1970, because that was the first year of the draft lottery where they pulled the, the dates out of a, a, a bowl and I got number 212. So I, I wanted to declare myself 1A and survive that year so I would never have to worry about it again. And that's how it happened, but I couldn't be in school. So I left school and didn't go back for three years. And the irony is when I went back, I tried to come back as a theater arts major and they said, no, you can't do that. There's, there's The department is overcrowded as it is. You have to pick another one. I said, well, I. I need to make sure that I can apply all the credits from my previous three years towards my graduation. So I said, what can I take? And they said, well, psychology might be open. So <laughs> I ended up with a psychology degree. <laughs> okay. And it served you well. I'm, I must say it served you well with dealing with the crazies, including Alan and myself. In no, which, no. I would think you had to you deal with Alan. <laughs> Look, there was only one time, and maybe you can refresh my memory. During the shooting of Demon Knight, you got really upset. It's the only time I ever saw you really upset. You called us into your office, and and you were really yelling at us. And I don't remember. You, you remember the story? Yeah, I, I remember, remember sitting this there and said, "God, this is the Gil Adler that I admire and, and adore." And that, and he was. I thought. I, I, I can't remember if I was really guilty of anything. Do you want to hear the rest of that story now? No, yeah, there, sure. there is a back half to the story that was, it's going to disappoint you. Well, no, it, I don't know. Well, we'll see how you react. I don't think it'll disappoint. You want to tell it? You want me to tell it? <laughs> yeah, no, you tell it, man. So, so I, I was mad. I was very mad because I felt that Alan and I were talking to you, to the department heads, telling them our problems about money and time, and nobody was listening. And, and I just blew up at that meeting. And I smashed my hand, if you remember, on the desk really hard. Yeah. And well, I that's, thought that's, I, that's what emphasized that you were yeah. pretty angry. And I really thought, no one else knew this, but I really thought I broke my hand. I was in agony. And so if you remember, at the end of me blowing up like that, I left my own office. Yeah. I walked out, stormed out, slammed the door, right? Yeah. I walked, I walked around the airport. We were at the Van Nuys Airport, I think. And I, oh, and I, yeah. That's where we were. Yeah. And I just walked around the airport a little bit. Right. And yeah. Alan came Alan came after me, caught up to me and he said, hey, hey, you OK? I said, yeah, I'm fine. Why? Yeah, goes, well, yeah. well, well, you, you know, because no one's ever seen you like that. And everyone was really concerned that you went crazy like that. And I remember, I think, looking at Alan and going, haven't you ever seen good acting? <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, uh, you know, um, if there was were an Academy Award category for that, you would have been on top. It, it was only the only way I can get everyone's attention to realize that we weren't kidding around. We weren't saying, oh, we, we don't have that much money. So you'd spend, you know, 10 percent more. We we didn't have anything. And that yeah. was the only way for me to get everyone's attention to make. You know, me you know I, I, you, as I recall, early in when we were doing the first uh, feature film, you know, because there was more money everyone felt a little more yeah, free. And, and I think at yeah. first, until that moment, everyone thought, well, we're doing a feature film. Come on, let you lighten up. And everyone thought there was more wriggle room and, and there really wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I uh, have, I have, I have a few memories, distinct memories from Demon Knight, I can assure you. And, well, well, we, well, we, that, we that, that memory, by the way, that memory, uh, a lot of people from our crew still have, because oh. I've heard a lot of people, Say to me, do you remember the day you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I wasn't the only one that remembered that. How oh, to no. make an impression? No. Now, Tommy Bellissimo and Charlie Bardinelli from Visual uh, Effects, they remembered it. I mean, a lot of people remember it. Greg Melton remembered it. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Well, Greg, speaking of Greg, I'm like, what a, uh, 
I remember about Greg is his attention to detail. I can remember walking into one of the sets. I can't remember the name of the episode. And I saw outlets that weren't live or or little things that were just there that should be there in a real real yeah, set, yeah, setting, yeah, yeah, yeah. but normally wouldn't be put there. And I, that was Greg. Yeah. He was exceptional. He still is. He exceptional. was. Oh, what, yeah. what's, what is he still around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's we, around we, and he's working and he's yeah. still living in L.A. And so we, we, we had the pleasure of talking to him during during the first season. Oh, there you go. There you yeah. Go. Uh, now, when you left, all right. So when you finally get, you had a psychology degree, but degree, but you weren't heading into the world of psychology. You were heading into the world of <laughs> uh, film and TV. Yeah. Well, once I left, uh, of course, while I was in my last year, I went back three years later because yeah. I felt I needed to finish a degree that I had started. Um, I hate leaving something behind. I needed to fill it up. So um, I went back and I, I was paying my own way, which at UCLA was very reasonable, but I still had to work two or three jobs. Mm -hmm. So when I wasn't going to class, I was working either midnight to eight in the morning or working all weekend long. Um, and once I got my degree, I ended up going right back to where I was driving tow truck or, and I thought, um, I started trying to act too about that time. I, I had actually started doing that in the night. I got my SAG card actually in 71. And I, I, I see, yeah, I see. In nineteen seventy-two, you 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 have a credit. You played the part of Archie in the Partridge Family. Yes, and I also had a, had a, a a day day player role on the Waltz. Yeah, you were you were Tedro Covered. Yeah, yeah. I was. I and it's funny. I watched it not long ago because I and and I realized just with my one line of dialogue and the dialogue that surrounded it. I was cast as the person who would be the least likely to be a date, but was a date because there was no one else. And I thought, wow, I should have been insulted by that. But no. <laughs> so so you uh, and what kind of character was Archie? What was that also character work? Archie. Know? Well, Archie is another classic Hollywood story. <laughs> the the teaser for that particular episode was a two minute teaser, which was just between me and the lead. Um, setting up the plot, and I thought, "Wow, this is wonderful!" I get just a scene with just the two of us, and I let the parents know and all the friends know that I was in the show. The show started, and that scene was gone completely. Oh. <laughs> so I came in at the end. Oh. I, I at the very end of the show, for whatever reason, I pop out of a closet, and I don't think, yeah, don't don't even go there. But. Um, and had one or two lines, and that was it. And 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 my relative said, "That's it." And I said, "Yeah, that's all that's left." Is, but that's is that not all the there end. is? And that happened to me. So, uh, actors' life is. I I, uh, I have great uh, admiration for actors that can put up with all of the rejection until they can actually find something that that uh, with which they're comfortable. I I the the classic story of of my trying to go and make something of myself as an actor. I was working. I thought I had latitude, more latitude to to uh, go to auditions if I had a job that had weird hours. So I actually got a job as an ambulance driver for a professional ambulance in Glendale, which hmm. was owned by Rand Brooks. Does that name ring any bells for you? Rand Brooks. Keep going. Rand Brooks. He was married, actually, to Stan Laurel's daughter. Wow. But Rand Brooks... In our generation, we both we we best know him as Corporal Boone on the Rin Tin Tin TV series. Wow! Oh dear, oh my but God! If you're a if you're a classic movies fan, you would know him from Gone with the Wind. He's the first person to actually marry Scarlett O'Hara. Oh, he's and then go character. off to war and die of pneumonia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was Rand Brooks. That was his really big claim to fame. So he owned professional ambulance and because of his uh, understanding of how difficult it was to try to be an actor, um, he actually covered for me when I had a daytime interview and would drive the ambulance while I went to Hollywood for an audition. 
And I went to one of these um, that was at uh, Screen Gems. Mm -hmm. Walked in. It was supposed to be for a, a um, soap opera. And I thought, wow, soap opera. If you can get a soap opera, a, a continuing role in a soap opera, that's huge for any actor. So I walk into the audition and I, I couldn't, I didn't have time to change. So I still had my, my professional ambulance uniform on with the pat, shoulder patches. And I walk in and they say, what, what, what's with the, and I said, well, I'm, I drive an ambulance when I'm not acting. And they said, aren't you, um, what's code three mean? And uh, don't you get queasy at the sight of blood? And I said, no, that would make me truly ineffective in my job. And I said, but, I love ask, being asked questions about my being an ambulance driver, but aren't there some sides you want me to read? Yeah. And they looked at me, the one casting grace says, oh, no, no, you're completely wrong for the part, but thanks for coming in. <laughs> but as I exited, one of them said, wait a minute, wait a minute, um, go upstairs. They're casting a pilot about um, a hospital and they might have an ambulance driver part. So I went upstairs and sure enough, they gave me the ambulance driver part. So talk about typecasting. There you have it. And and you did that a couple of times. You did it in police. Story, oh, yeah. Police well, story. once once I got once I got that job, Al Honorado, who was a casting director at Screen Gems in Columbia, um, knew I, I had a SAG card and I knew how to drive an ambulance. And so anytime something came up on Police Story, Police Woman, Joe Force or all those series that revolved around uh police departments um he would call me and it would only be one like one line you know like i'm sorry he didn't make it or you know, something dramatic <laughs> like that you found a niche you found a niche <laughs> i i i i like i said this yeah is but that's cast that that's that's typecasting which is not what you want that's why i love to do the waltons because it wasn't been an ambulance driver sure sure sure, sure oh you know if, if, if only you had been allowed to to pursue your your you know to head in that direction to be uh what was his so name? Where, so where was the trend? I'm sorry. So where was the transition? Just to get back to the ading, where where was the transition to that? Oh well, um, as an ambulance driver, which is what how I was literally making my living at, at two dollars an hour. Um, I wanted, I like everything else in my life. I wanted to be the best I could be at whatever it was, whether it was flipping hamburgers or Tommy's or driving an ambulance. I wanted to be the most effective I could be. So I, I actually got trained as a paramedic. I figured if this is the what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life, I wanna be uh, at the pinnacle. Yeah. And yeah. so I got trained as a paramedic and shortly thereafter, and I'm not sure how I learned this, but I found out that the IATSC had a local for, for medics, for LVNs, RNs, and paramedics. They could actually work on sets standing by for a medical emergency, which usually meant bromo seltzers or a band or splinter removal, which I got very good at, by the way. So I, I, I started calling this one contact that I had made at uh, TBS. And in those days, it, if you got 30 days in at the job when there was an overflow and they couldn't hire off the availability list, they would hire you as a permit. So I got my 30 days in as a permit and then started working regularly as a medic on sets when they were on location, either local or away. Mm -hmm. And being the type of personality that I am where I couldn't just sit there and do nothing waiting for someone to have an upset stomach, I started looking around and getting involved with whatever department needed help. So I, in some shows, I was a grip. Some shows, I was an electrician. Some shows, I was a prop man. Some... In fact, in some, and then some shows I was an AD. Hmm. Uh, and there were some people in the crew that never knew what I actually did. They accepted me for whatever I was I was doing. Um, and that I also find during that course, I found out about the assistant director training program and started applying it. It's a test given only once a year. And I started applying and took the test. Every year I'd get a postcard saying, well, in order to move to the next level, which was an interview, uh, you needed a score of 650 and you got 630. So I'd say, well, I'll make that up next year. So I took the test five times. On the wow. fifth time, uh, uh, it was the first time they charged the fee. It was $20 up front. 
So instead of 1,500 people taking this test on the campus of USC, it was only about 800. It cut the number in half. So I figured that was to my advantage. Well, that year I got the postcard giving me the interview because at that time I'd already been on sets for like seven or eight years. Mm-hmm. When I walked into the interview room, half the people on the table knew me from working with me on the sets. Right. And because I had actually done the job, although unofficially, I knew the answers to whatever questions they would pose. So I what, got in. What kind and, of questions do they ask in that interview? Well, they would pose hypotheticals and, and you'd say, how would you handle this as an assistant director? And, and I can't remember the exact questions, but I usually would come up with a fairly astute answer. Um, and then I realized after I was in the program that the whole program existed primarily to get women and minorities into the guild. Um, because if you look back, they would take normally during busy years, they take a class of about 20 people of the 20. Three would be male Caucasians. Yeah. So for me to have been in that select group was I, I, I I was incredibly fortunate. Yeah. So the odds were stacked and I didn't even know it against me, but I still was able to persevere. So I'm mm-hmm. I'm fairly proud of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we, we to get where all of us threaded various needles to get where we got. It's it is Oh absolutely. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, then, so, so go ahead, good. No, no, so you've you found your passion with with uh, with being a first. Well, yeah, after all those years on sets, mm-hmm. I realized that I was best at organizational things and and being in what I would consider mid management. Um, I was not shy in stepping forward and telling my opinions, and and I obviously, uh, if I saw a situation, I would immediately think about a solution for that situation, uh, which put me in good stead as an assistant director. In fact, one of uh, one of my early jobs was uh, as second AD on Moonlighting, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and within I'd say a month and a half, two months, one of the firsts had had enough of Bruce and Sybil and quit. <laughs> and it was pretty much like the day of a shooting, and they said, "Lee, you're first. Mm-hmm. So it, we were shooting at LAX and I'm, I'm running the set as a first mm-hmm. AD at L- LAX. And you know how difficult the, the logistics are there. I had a DGA representative sidle on up next to me and say, uh, so you're a first thing. And I said, well, yeah. And he said, you have the days to do that? Because by DGA rules, you had to be a right. second AD for 400 days. And I said, well, no, but the company's willing to take a risk with me. And they said, nope, that's not going to happen. So the very next day, I was back to being a second. What the guild never knew, and they wouldn't be watching this, would they? Um, is that 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 moonlighting? Not allowed to. Yeah. Okay. Moonlighting did allow me to be the first AD on second units, but we didn't. We kept that under the radar. So. Uh, you got your four hundred hours. Yeah, I got my four hundred days, and and days, uh, days, I mean, yeah, sorry, and sorry, then sorry. moved up to first uh, on moonlighting, actually. Uh, and did another two years as a first AD on moonlighting. So it was, uh, that was, uh, talk about a unique experience. So I don't think there was ever a, sh- a TV series like yeah. moonlighting and it hasn't been ever since. I mean, obviously, whereas the other first could not handle dealing with Sybil and Bruce, you, yeah. you were able to uh, navigate those shows. You learned how to do that. Yeah. It was, well, you know, as producers, uh, the business is a lot to do with personality management. Yeah. It's a business that unfortunately caters to abysmal behavior yeah. because they, they believe that's the, the price of, of doing business. And I, I will never agree with that, but um, that's what, and especially in television, when you have a show that's based on two stars, they understand very early on in the process how much power they have. Yeah. And boy, did Bruce and Sybil abuse that power. Mm. And then how did you go from there to Tales? Well, F.A. Miller served as a UPM on on uh, Moonlighting briefly. Right. And that's right. how I met F.A. And, of course, F.A. brought me into Tales. You, you were also you also did uh, Walker with, with F.A.? What's that? You also did Walker, Texas Ranger with F.A.? Oh, only for a short period of time. Yeah. I replaced the first that moved away from that to go something better. 
And then I went to Texas and yeah, at the end of the season, I wasn't invited back because it was, it, that was not a fun show to do. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, I, it was, it was basically a, a rewrite of other scripts from the producers. And in fact, we got, I remember getting a script that uh, supposedly the main character was uh, somehow lost in the mountains and had to take shelter in a cave. And I tried to explain to the producers, this is Dallas. There are no mountains in Dallas. <laughs> so I said, you, you really need a different take on this script. And I said, did the writers have the writers ever been here? Do they know what the locales offer? Because this not. is impossible. Right. So it's that kind of thing. It was it was oh. and there was the challenge was week to week. Gotcha. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So F.A. Miller brings you into Tales from the Crypt. And so you came, you came aboard our second season on the show, which began with Tom Hanks directing. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think that that season was really when everything really gelled. That's yeah, you know, we, we kind of. Well, yeah, we, we, Tales we, we was, really became. Yeah, Tales was, was truly amazing at what was accomplished. You yeah. could, you remember the John Frankenheimer episode oh, yeah. in the library. <laughs> Gosh, yes. And that amazing set, yeah. two story set right. that we I, I I remember us trying to to uh, brainstorm another use for that rather than having to tear it down and unfortunately couldn't come up with something so down it went and what a yeah. what an incredible set to yeah. be lasting that to be used only 5 days. Yeah. Do you re do you remember with that with that show with John Frankenheimer how you would uh, a few times Lee you would call me and say we're falling behind we're going behind we're now further behind it's falling <laughs> and and I would say um, I would come down to the set and take John aside just the two of us talking and sort of try to get him back on track and he would say all the right things and I would leave and go back upstairs. And then 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour later, I'd get these emails from you, not emails, but messages from you saying, oh, my God, we're falling further behind, further behind. <laughs> and ultimately, talk about psychology. Ultimately, I had to call Frankenheimer, stop production and have him come to my office. And I closed the door and I would and I would just read him the riot act and uh -huh. tell him what he was going to do and what he wasn't going to do. And am I clear? And does he understand me? But and, and you said yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he would go back downstairs and then do pretty much what we asked him to do. Yeah. But, well, no, I, I, to because, be honest, you know, I don't he, really remember that. No. Well, you know, uh, Frankenheimer being a classic Hollywood director, he was king yeah. of his domain. The, yeah, the yeah. set uh, on the set, that's his. That's you walk, you're just a producer walking onto his set. You are nothing and you're nobody. But in your office, when you're yeah. up to the producer suite, well, then he's just a director for a hire with his, yeah. hand, his hands going, Mr. Producer, what 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 shall I do, sir? So I was glad he remembered. I was glad he remembered what happened in the office by the time he got back down to the set. Well, but you, <laughs> you, you, you could have easily just said, I remember this. Oh, hell you, with that. I'm going to do what I want to do. You have to, you know, it, it, the context was everything for a guy like John Frankenheimer. Where you talk to him was as important as what you were going to say to him. Yeah. Yeah, well, so I, I, he and I had a very good relationship. Cool. Uh, in fact, he hired me to do a, a, a diamonds commercial for, you know, Elizabeth Taylor's uh, perfumes. Yeah. So I did a commercial and we shot it like a feature. In fact, an entire day was set up for just a magic hour shot on the Queen Mary. Wow. Uh, and so it was quite the experience. And afterwards, he tried to. You might remember he tried. I don't know. I think I told you this. Did he call me and he wanted to take me as his first on a feature? And I said, I really owed my allegiance to Tails. And I, I turned him down. Huh. You didn't know that. Did not. Know I don't that. think I knew that because he called yeah. me up and he said, I want you to do it as well. No, it's only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I in, in fact, I, I off every once in a while, I think back, what would have happened had I because he went off to shoot a feature with uh, Raul Julia. Yeah, and it would have uh, been a very tough shoot because yeah, I think he yeah. was down in Mexico. Yeah, and I, I said I'm just as happy to be here amongst the people that I trust and who trust me. And it's this is the perfect working environment for me. So why would I want to leave it? 
That, yeah. that wasn't the island of Dr. Moreau, was it? That, 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 that... No, no. Uh, <laughs> it was, I can't remember what it was called. I'd have to look up uh, Raul Julia's uh, uh, resume to see what the, because it was one of the last things he did. I don't think he, he uh, lived much longer past that experience. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. think it killed him, but I, I, I don't think he, I, I think he died relatively shortly thereafter. Yeah, I, we 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 were talking to to Steve D'Souza, and one of the last things Raul Julia did was was Street Fighter that uh, Steve wrote. Oh, really? And it was yeah, it was real hard to get him across the finish line. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. he was a he was very damn young. good actor. Oh, lovely! Oh, terrific! A great live. He was, a, he was a lovely. He was a great actor. He was also a really sweet man. I I met him years and years ago to the Shakespeare Festival and and uh, Shakespeare in the Park. Joe Papp, Bernie Gerson. Where, who was always asking for a job, and I met Raul down there because uh, he was—he would always see me standing around like, "You must be somebody has to do with the production." But I, for the life of me, I don't know why, because you never do anything. And I was just there <laughs> trying to get a job, and so I became quite friendly with him for for a while, and he was just the nicest guy in the world. Yeah, there there are a few of those in the business, but they unfortunately it's the 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 other type that you remember probably more. Yes, yes, indeed. What, what would you say, Lee, as you look back before you 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 quit the uh, the madness? What was your worst day ever? On oh, a, that's on easy. A film or TV? That's set? easy. That's actually not just a day. It was the entire series. The entire time was there was was uh, unfortunately um, thinking that I could be above it. I accepted a job on Nash Bridges, and that oh was as close to a living hell on the set as possible. Wow. Don Johnson um, is my uh, personification of an antichrist. He is, if, if the conservative right were to pick someone to say, there's a demon in Hollywood, that would be Don Johnson. He, I, I swear to God, he intentionally wanted to pe have people just totally nervous around him, afraid that they might do something wrong. Because he would, he would act very swiftly. He on in public in San Francisco. We did a show, an episode, one of my the first one I did. David Carson directing. Who I don't know if you know David Carson, English director. Mm -hmm. He wants what he wants. It doesn't matter who he's dealing with. He just wants what he wants. Yeah. So you try to accommodate his desires. And it was a running shot in the Barracuda there, you know, uh, with Don and, 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 um, uh, yeah, the other half of, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He worked on it with us too. Who? Cheech, Cheech, Marin. Oh, right, right, right. And, uh, who was lovely when he worked with us, but under the influence of Don Johnson became not so nice. Right. So anyway, they're driving the Barracuda and having dialogue, and he wouldn't rehearse anything, Don. And he said, let's just go. Let's shoot. So I had to, I'm sitting on the insert car and directing the insert car as to when to move forward and at what speed. So the very first take, basically rehearsal, at the end of the road that, that David had chosen was the next set. So there were all these lights around the windows of this interior so, of course, we get to that and the dialogue's not finished yet. So Don <laughs> realizes it's it's total a, a total waste, gets out of his car screaming that we need to get our act to get well. He didn't say act together exactly. And there are people from San Francisco watching and he does it right in front of anybody and everybody oh, and boy. storms off to his motorhome. So I had to go to his motorhome to beg him to come back to the set and try it again. Um, and of course you wouldn't listen to, could you stop at a stop sign while you're still talking? Maybe give us a little extra time. Oh no, he doesn't stop at stop signs. Could you, could you speed the dialogue up a little bit? Could you slow the car down a little bit? This is what we've got to work with. I'm not even sure how we got it, but we got it. But from that time on, I, I was enemy number one. I was the first one that was going to be, have the head lopped off. In fact, the next episode, I had the transportation captain, a very lovely guy. The people in the crew were terrific. Came up to me at the end of the day, tapped me on the shoulder and says, you have to watch your back. And I looked at him and I said, any show where I actually have to watch my back, I don't want to be here. 
So within a couple of days, on the last day of shooting of this, my second episode, I before I wrapped the company, I said, I want to thank everyone in the crew for getting me through this second episode. Thank you very much. And that's a wrap. And the unit manager was behind me and he tapped me on the shoulder and he says, and it will be your last. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's how I was fired. So, yes, that was my worst experience. Boy, my boy. Oh, <laughs> man. That is brutal. That is brutal. Ay, ay, ay. Oh, boy. What would you say was your best day on the set? It would have to be something associated with tales. Hmm. Um, you know, maybe the, just just getting to know Tom Hanks a little bit. And, and in fact, I said to him after the five days, you know, well, 10 days with prep. But hmm. after at the end of the show, I said, no matter what you do, whether it's producing or acting, directing, writing, you will be successful. You just you have the right attitude and the right personality and i wish you all the best because yeah he I mean, was, really, he's but, right at the top of my list yeah you 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 had particular insight on his process because i mean you are facilitating his process of thinking this whole new way how did you find his because th- this really is it's a whole other way of thinking of storytelling did, if he adapted yes we know for a fact oh, yes, he adaptability well is him. is like his middle name i mean he he, he would know exactly what to do, what he could do, what he couldn't do. Uh, I don't think the the word brilliant um, says it all. I, I, you know, it's it's not enough. He is he is um, a Renaissance man when it comes to Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, and I, in fact, when you mentioned uh, Walker Texas Ranger, when I was at, in Dallas on Walker Texas Ranger is when Tom won his first Academy Award, and I still had his home phone number. So I used the set phone at a lunch break, I think, and called his home number, figuring I'd get the machine. And I'd say, I just wanted to say I was I, I, all I, I, I was very excited for your win. And uh, I have to say your acceptance speech was a- incredible. That's all I wanted to say. So what happens? He picks up the phone <laughs> and I said, Tom, I didn't really expect to talk to you, but I just wanted to convey my congratulations. And he said, is this is this lead? He said, I said uh, is this the skydiving AD? And I said, yeah. <laughs> How, who else would have remembered that? Uh, uh, so uh, I, that that's that in a nutshell. Yeah, 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 you, yeah, yeah. The kind of person Tom Hanks is. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, we, we, I, we would definitely agree. Uh, yes, one of the among the many happy experiences working on tales that a- absolutely uh, no argument. Um, when you well let's talk about skydiving when did you when did you start skydiving i started skydiving in 1978 um wow really that far back yeah uh the, it was um i was actually on a move as a medic i was on a movie called the stuntman richard right. rush sure. yeah he right. rails back huh. hero tool yeah, yeah i have yeah, wonderful yeah. Wow. stories about this show but as a medic um I got to know a lot of the stuntmen. And uh, I, as part of the show, there was a gentleman that showed up at Indian Dunes to do a jump for the film. And I introduced myself and got to know him. And And I told him that I had tried to, to jump some years earlier with a girlfriend, went down to Elsinore's the, the drop zone, and it was closed on a Saturday. And I couldn't understand why. So we went to uh, at the casino, which was the local restaurant, to have breakfast before heading back to L.A. And I happened to mention to our server and they said, Oh yeah, they closed that down. People were dying left or right. <laughs> and my then girlfriend looked at me and said, okay, that's it. I'm not doing this. And I said, I don't think that's the whole story. Well, as it turns out back in those days, this is mid seventies uh, drop zones in, in California were, were uh, governed by the state of California's department of transportation. So if there was a death, they would come in and investigate and as it turns out, these were experienced skydivers that just didn't fall or whatever the problem was, but it was it was of their own doing. So they were open the next weekend. Um, but of course, that that didn't make any difference because the time had come and gone. And then mm. I was reintroduced when I met this this gentleman who said, I will teach you. Come talk to me and I will. So I talked to the other statement and they said, yeah, let's all do it. 
except Whitey Hughes, who said, well, wait a minute, I've got a commitment for next weekend. Can we wait another weekend? And I said, sure, I've waited five years. I can wait another weekend. So we decided we'd all meet at Elsinore in the parking lot at, at a designated time. And guess who's the only one that showed up? <laughs> oh, you're kidding. No, none of them. None of them showed wow. up. So yes. I went through the training one-on-one -on -one and went, I got in the plane and on the way ride to altitude, I said to my instructor, who's not the fellow that I had met, it was one of his, his employees because he was otherwise engaged. But I, met, I said to him, because this was in the Bay of what we call belly warts of, of front reserves. And I said, if I have to use this, you owe me another jump for free. And he said, I like your attitude, kid. <laughs> so I jumped. It was fine. And I was hooked. That was it. So I jumped for 30 years, I, you know, with about 3,800 jumps. And when I moved here, I was jumping even for a short while for local drop zones in New England. Hmm. But my knees were shot. My neck was shot. Yeah, and I yeah. thought, you know, to be smart, you have to know when to quit. Just like when you have a driver's license, you got to know when you're a danger to yourself and to others. Sure, sure. And sure. I thought it was time. I, I really wanted to quit it on an even number. I really wanted to quit at 4,000 jumps, but never quite got there. Oh, uh, that is too bad. You might, you might, next time you're asked that question, you might start by saying, the day after you left moonlighting was your first day of jumping. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, well, it's I, funny. I, I uh, people ask me why? Did, why did you skydive? And I said, you have to understand. In my job, which was then as um, uh, on the on the set, I said it was uh, the set can be a, a very pressurized situation. Gosh, yes. With long hours, and believe me, you want a hobby on which you can concentrate and just push everything else out of your mind. And if you don't concentrate on skydiving, you tend not to do it for very long. Yeah, one way or the other. I remember when you told us you were skydiving, I was blown away. I was like, what? You're doing you? You're doing what? Why? Why would you do that? You're crazy. You're crazy. I you remember nuts? going nuts on you. But I, I remember you 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 tried to talk you know you tried to talk me into it and and, and a couple of times I I was I I, I thought about it. Just and, for the experience, just when, to say that you've done it. I'm yeah. so disappointed because as we started this conversation, I was going to say to you, Lee, I'm finally ready. Where, when, when, <laughs> when you go? Well, I'll tell you uh, that the one thing that was so attractive to me about skydiving is yeah. when you're jumping with someone else, you are literally putting your life in their hands and their lives in your hands. So there's an immediate bond that is created that is never broken. So, once, once you jump with people, and I had a group of friends that I jumped with all the time. Yeah, um, those people are become friends for life. Uh, so sure. that that was very attractive to me. Did any of them ever die from jumping? No, I I knew people that, as we say in the sport, went in, but um, what none of my, in, close, none like of my into close the friends. earth. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I I once suggested to the United States Parachute Association, which is the overriding organization to which we all belong. I said, you know, you could come up with a bumper sticker that says skydiving good to the last drop. And they didn't jump all over that? They thought it was a little negative, <laughs> a little too dark for the USBA. So they did not adopt it. But no I got sense support. of humor. Yeah. See, that's why we liked you for tales. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You have to, are you kidding, to survive in this business, don't you have to have a sense of humor? Oh, God, oh God. yeah, tr truly, uh, yes. Uh, but this is also true in politics, and, and you, you, are, you are now a, you're now a, well, you- No, you, not, not so much a sense of humor as a very thick skin. Uh, yes, yes, yes. You have traded in film sets for, yeah. for civil, yeah. uh, being a civil servant. I think I was the uh, the in my six years in the state house in Concord as a state representative. Yeah, I think I was probably the only state representative that held a SAG card, a DGA card, an IA card, and was a skydiver. I, I I'm pretty sure that I, I held a record in that regard. I bet, I bet. What was it like the first time that you ran for office? Now, the first office that you ran for in New Hampshire, state happened. rep. State rep. All right, and so yeah. that meets it was that Montpelier. What's that? No, no. Concord. 
Concord, Con- I'm sorry. Oh, Concord. God damn, I can Montpelius, I, Vermont. I got my New England yeah. states all confused. Oh, oh it's all the same. I'm it's all the same. of myself. Yeah. All right. So uh, Concord. All right. So Concord. So you you are a state rep in Concord. How right. often do do state reps meet in Concord? Well, you generally only meet a couple of times in session, but you also are a member of a standing committee. You're also appointed by the speaker to other ancillary boards and councils and commissions. Is it so full-time I would, job? I would end up driving to Concord at least three times a week. Oh, okay. So is it a full-time job? You don't, it's not considered a full-time job and it's certainly not paid as a full-time job because a New Hampshire state representative as well as a state senator actually yeah. is paid $100 per year. Huh. That's why we consider government in New Hampshire volunteer. I, I, I'm a city councilor now in Franklin, and I am paid $25 a month, right? Twenty, Yeah, $25 a month, which is more than a state rep, surprising. So, and I, that will go to charity. But that's See, Alan, all those years ago, I told you we were overpaying Lee Webb. I don't care what the union said. <laughs> there you go. All right, so so you didn't get into state government for 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 the money. Uh, no. What 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 took you into what state government? What prompted me? Yeah, what yeah. was my incentive? Yeah. Uh, Daniel Webster. Then Franklin, New Hampshire, is now because it, it 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 took property from other surrounding communities in order to become a town, but is the birthplace of Daniel Webster, and his birthplace site is actually a state park. Um, in my first year and a half here, the state came in and closed the park down because of maintenance issues for which they would not pay. I was incensed. So I, I ran for state rep. So I'd have some oomph, some, some uh, leverage with state parks and rec to get them off the snide and, and get some maintenance done on this state park. They'd accepted the responsibility. By God, they needed to follow through on it. In fact, I put in an, at my, my one of my first acts as a state rep was to put in an appropriations bill for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to pay for all of the maintenance issues that had been had deferred for years. Of course, it didn't pass because you just don't. But I, I was just trying to send a message. Yes, and, yes, yes. Did did you all right? Did you feel at home in that environment? I adjust well to almost any environment. So, yeah, it took me a while. Uh, I, I, I uh, got to know the process and I, I thought it was um, really inappropriate for most freshman legislators to jump in and start introducing all kinds of bills without knowing how to get them passed. So I, I learned and um, I was chair of a, a, my second term, I was chair of a, a committee. Uh, the Oil Fund Disbursement Board, and it's as much fun as it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> a, th- a thrill a minute, I'm sure. Oh, it was. And and knowing me, of course, once I was chair, I tried to mm. keep a sense of humor and try to keep things level and, and civil. Um, so I think I was appreciated in that in that role. Uh, but I was involved with other things, too. I was on the Film Commission in New Hampshire which didn't really do much, but was asked why we didn't have a, a, a tax credit like they do in Massachusetts. And I tried to explain to them it's because the state would lose money doing that. And, and we have enough problems just keeping the budget as it is. So um, that was never going to happen and still hasn't happened. Hmm. Have you ever have you two ever had anything to do with uh, or, or looked at Massachusetts as a, a shooting venue because of its tax situation? Yeah, I have. I yeah, have. and and well, was, was it was it ad- advantageous enough to truly seriously consider? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I I was doing a show for Disney uh, with uh, Jonathan Mostow and Bruce Willis uh, called <laughs> the Surrogate, Surrogates. Yeah, um, and uh, we were shooting there, and we prepped, and, and I left the show early. I I I had big problems. Uh, with um, Disney mainly because I, I I had just finished Superman. I came back. They called. I said, I'm not available. I'm cooked. They said, no, no, come in. I foolishly accepted the position, um, went to went with Mostow uh, to who I love a lot. And he was fantastic to work with. 
went to Boston, scouted everything. But while on, on the scout, I said to him and I said to Disney, look, I'll do this, but you don't have a reason why the guy would go into a chair, a stim chair and not live his life. There, there's no explanation. And to me, the whole the whole movie centers on what's that explanation? Because why would one just sit, you know, anyway, they were questioning the script. Yeah. And so yeah. they agreed with me as and Mostow did, too. And they said, OK, we'll we'll fix it. And I said, OK, as long as you're going to fix that, uh, I'll do it. And so I prepped it with with Jonathan. And then we got closer and closer to shooting. I'm not hearing anything. I started challenging that. I got into a big blowout with them. And I said, you know something? I'm not the guy for this movie because you're not going to make those changes. I can see it. We're three weeks out. No one's even talking about them. This is going to fail because you don't answer that question. And what was, the, what was the movie called? Surrogates. Never heard of it. Yeah. Well, it was a Disney movie. Um, yeah. And, and Disney and, Disney's changed a lot over the last oh, couple yeah. of decades when they have a movie called Surrogate. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so that uh, so so we we actually shot well they actually shot in Boston. We prepped it for Boston, but we looked at you know in, in those days we looked at Rhode Island because that was a hot place to shoot as well. They had a good tax credit. Um, and I think the South was coming into their own. I think the Carolinas and uh, Georgia, and Georgia, Louisiana. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we didn't look at Louisiana. We looked at, uh, I think, Georgia and North Carolina. Yeah. Well, it's I, I just never thought that the, the problem with anything uh, tax credit or trying to lower major productions to New Hampshire is that, and I try to explain this to them, that unless you have <laughs> trained crew, mm. Right. And places, you know, like studio space, yeah, yeah. will never get major productions because they're trying. The only reason that they they would be looking at here is to save money, and you don't save money by bringing people from Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, you have to have <laughs> yeah. People on the ground here. Yeah, and they never quite got that concept. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as a state, you're probably better off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> probably so. Yeah. Indeed. Uh. So, from from this point forward, I mean, you're do you have any ambitions to do anything else in the business? And, and, in anything, um, I, mean, I, well, I mean, well, I mean, well, I, I to, to 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 tell you the truth, if you look, I, one of the most interesting things I found since I moved here is um, okay, it was a matter of ego, but I looked myself up on IMDb, and there That's is one in, does. The, in the synopsis of me of what summing me up, it says. Retired to New Hampshire and helped yeah. save a property once associated with Daniel Webster. Yes. Where do they get this information? Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. I thought that was really interesting, seeing as there were all many so many other things that they missed uh, in part of my bio, but that's all right. Um, one of the things that I've I've become truly passionate about here is I'm I've been president of the local historical society for the better part of the last 18 years, found a place for them to have a museum and a meeting space that they'd never had before, created the museum. And that is my legacy to the city of Franklin. Um, and I hope that once I'm gone, someone will pick it up and carry on because I, I put a lot of work and, and money actually, because there were things that because of my collecting habits, I used to get catalogs to all kinds of various auctions throughout uh, New England and, and other places. And I'd come across something that was relevant to Franklin. Like uh, there was a deed, and I think the year was 1766 deed, wow. made out in the hand of Josiah Bartlett that was to sell a lot on which um, our Historical society, the, the grounds on which our society sits mm -hmm. used to be uh, King's Grant land before the revolution. And this document was selling one of those lots by a gentleman who had been had been um, kidnapped by Indians, taken into Canada and sold into slavery and escaped and come back and was in the hand of Josiah Bartlett, a signer of our Declaration of Independence. And I said, I've got to have this for Franklin. So I bought it and then donated it to the society. And I've done that time and time again, because there were things that we wouldn't have had I not come across them in auction catalogs. You, wow. you, you, you never do things half-assedly. 
I try not to. You know, I it's just like um, I live in a house that is ostensibly a Victorian. However, we learned a big, through photos from our historical society that it had started its life as a two-story farmhouse, had been picked up off of its foundation, moved up to a higher part of the same lot, and then the Victorian built around it. Wow. And here I am. We we found we we ended up, and frankly, because of this house, and I thought I need to to uh, develop skills that will save me money because <laughs> I was quoted to paint the house, the whole house. It's a large house. It's about 7,000 square feet. Is that what it is? 7, wow. Something like that. Wow. Yeah. And, and um, I'm in one of the only heated rooms that we, cause we never mind. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I got a quote in, in 2004, I got a quote to paint the house into $16,000. Wow. No. So I painted the house myself. In stages, it took me three years and going up and down ladders, scraping and painting with a brush. Oh my. Um, and after that, I then I realized the, the roof needed some work and I hired somebody to do the portion I couldn't get to, but they couldn't do all of it. So I said, OK, so I started. I, YouTube is a fascinating resource. So I, I <laughs> went on YouTube, learned how to roof and have been roofing my house in, in portions uh, ever since. I'm I'm a journeyman electrician, plumber, plasterer. I'm very good with drywall. Uh, so I've acquired all these wonderful skills. I would hire someone who knew what they were doing and watch them. And they, I had one person who said, "Why are you doing this?" I said, "To learn, not as, as as not to criticize, just to learn." I replaced the entire front porch except for the part of the original uh, tongue and groove boards that were under a a three-story pillar that I couldn't lift up to get the old boards out. So I just left them, but everything else I replaced. So I've learned an, an enormous amount of things. In fact, um, one of my proudest achievements, somebody gave us a little footstool, a little padded footstool, about that big with three legs. So I looked at it and I took one of the legs off and used it as a template and, and created a fourth leg that you, that you have to look very closely to realize that it wasn't an original leg. So I'm pretty proud of that. And, and life, and life is, so a, are we. <laughs> life is about adjustments, right? Is it's oh my God. you yeah, say you started oh. this whole chain of, of conversation by saying, you know, you you, you want to be the I, I want to be the best that I can be, whether it's cooking hamburgers yeah, yeah. at Tommy's or roofing my own house you know that's really the message, really give, the message. A shit. give a shit that's that's that, that <laughs> that's the most important thing in the world no i i i i appreciate that more than you understand i i i yeah hey i did a whole podcast you know in the with the exact same spirit you know when i started the the whole thing the beginning of last year i i, I had not a bloody clue what i was doing but you know you you but you learn yeah, trial and a lot of error. Learn quickly. <laughs> you learn quickly. Uh, Lee, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for spending this this time with us. First, first of all, all right. So we'll, we'll we'll conclude the interview portion of it, and that was awesome. That was really, I I I think I've got four different shows here out, out of <laughs> out, out of this material. This oh, one. and we've not only scratched the surface. Oh um, yes, yes, I have yes, to yes, tell yes. you though that I was I was so excited to get your email and be able to, to, to reach out and, and reconnect yeah. with you and Gil. It's been an absolute joy. I thank you for that. Alan. You, you know, the, the whole, the, the whole fucking thing about this podcast is the doors that it opened that had been closed. Yeah. And, and it really, it, it's, I'm, if you told me at the beginning of 2020, of 2022, the beginning of last year, if you told me on January 1st, where I would be, what I would be doing on December 31st of this past year I, with with this guy, with, with the guy in the other <laughs> box over here, I, I just told you, you, you're a fucking high. What are you smoking? <laughs> Can I have some? It's stronger than what I'm smoking. <clears throat> well, that's right. In the, in, the year, in the year 1997, if you'd asked me where I was going to be in 20 years and somebody suggested I'd be a state representative of New Hampshire, they would have been a candidate for a rubber room. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> Life is so strange. 
and yet and yet I'm so grateful at the the, the weird twists and turns it takes and oh, yeah. it's taken. I'm, it makes yes, it interesting. I, I, I'm I'm thrilled to be to be back in touch with everybody here today. Really, truly. So I, I want I, you to know something. I got involved with a local community theater group. In fact, um, when I bought this house, we didn't live in it for four years. But being a small town, yeah, word got out rumors that a, a Hollywood director producer had bought a house in Franklin. And of course, I, every time I'd run into someone, I'd correct them. I say, no, no, no. no. I was an assistant director. Don't, so don't elevate funny. me past my station. <laughs> and so yes. I got involved with this community theater group and I started directing and producing plays. And I said, now you can call me a director producer. So I'll be on funny. a local level, but. Well, okay. Uh, all right. So, you know, when you finally got to that, what, what, how did you find that? Because really, you know, oh. as a first, you're not called on to be creative. You're, you're called no. on to be a Mr. Logistics. I, now, know, I was, I was creative behind the scenes and tried to, you know, I do whatever I, whenever I could be creative, hmm. I would be. Oh, you know, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. But, 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 but it wasn't what you were being, it wasn't in fact, with the job requirement. In fact, one of my most cherished memories was when Toby Hooper was directing. And he was one of the few directors. I used to say to almost every director with whom I was coupled, I'd say, if you don't mind, if I have a good idea, may I share it with you? Because if it's a really good idea, you can have it. If it's sure. a really bad idea, it's mine. Yeah. And I'll pay the price for it. And <laughs> and some directors say, no, I don't want to hear from you. You know, they just push you aside. But Toby was always there saying, do I need to do more coverage here? And I'd say, no, just, just move the camera this way. And you got the shot you need. And I, that's, I love that. Because yeah, yeah, that yeah. gave me a chance to be a little bit creative and to be part of that collaborative process. That's, every one of us wants to do that. Um, and I, I tell you, when I moved to Franklin and got involved with this community theater group, they wanted to do a fundraiser. And they knew I'd been associated with Hales and the Crypt. So they said, would you mind doing a little, and we're not going to charge admission or anything. But could you just talk about your Tales from the Crypt experiences? Because there was one fellow in particular that was just a huge fan. And I had some of the rejected um, magazine covers that we used oh, from yeah. our artist who's, remember, oh, who, Mike, who was our Mike, artist? Mike Vosberg. Mike Vosberg. Mike Vosberg yeah. yeah. And he had given me some of his rejects. Yeah. So I said, all right, let's do this. We can't charge admission because I'm going to show clips from the movie and I don't want to get into trouble with that. But... Um, I can sell my memorabilia and as at an auction, I will do the auction and all of the proceeds can go to the, to the theater group. So that's what we did. I sold my t-shirts. I sold it. I did not sell the hoard ornament <laughs> <laughs> and I did not sell my jacket. Um, oh, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I did sell the one that, the that yeah. Room. Yeah. I did sell the one that Joel Silver gave us with that he had, had bought for another show. And then it's like a lumberman's jacket. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, I and still have put it. The, the tails patch on it. Yeah. But here, this is a for tail. No, it's not for tails, Joel. That's just a, something you want to get rid of. Right. So I sold that stuff and that we raised, I don't know, a couple grand for the, the community theater group. And I was happy to do it. Sure. But So tails has been part of my life, even in New Hampshire. We know how you feel, Lee. We know how you feel. See you next time, everyone. The How Not to Make a Movie podcast is executive produced by me, Alan Katz, by Gil Adler, and by Jason Stein. Our artwork was done by the amazing Jody Webster, and Jason Jody, along with Mando, are all the hosts of the fun and informative Dads from the Crypt podcast. Follow them for what my old pal, the Crypt Keeper, would have called terrific Crypt content. 